The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92 000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the Engine Room Unpacked. I'm joined here today by Dean Holmes, the founder of the Wealth Network. We're going to unpack the key takeaways from the most recent episodes of the Engine Room to help you implement things in your business faster. You might even have some fun along the way. The Engine Room Unpacked. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another edition of the Engine Room Unpacked. Today, we're going to go through the next batch of wonderful practices who have graced our Engine Room podcast studio. The practices that I had the pleasure of speaking with was Pride Advice, led by Brett Chateau, based in Adelaide and Sydney, Burke Britton, who has practice manager Amy Lucas down there in Geelong, the Yarra Lane business, led by the head of financial planning, David Maloney in Melbourne, Absolute Wealth, fronted by Paul Barrett, who has a head office in Sydney, and the Wealth Shore business by the wonderful Brad Rogers down there in Warnable. And I'm joined here today with my partner in unpacking these practices, Dean Holmes. G'day, Dean. How are you? Hi, Andrew. It's great to be here again uh, to unpack the next five episodes of The Engine Room. Very excited today. As always, uh, this is big. There's a scale within the firms that we're going to run through today. Uh, there's a lot of growth ambitions across the firms uh, and some board and governments governance themes as well as we go. So, uh, Andrew, just remind our listener what the five themes that we want to unpack across the firms. Yeah, look, it's hard to actually, um, you know, try and get some sort of structure, but we tried last time and I think we pulled it off. So the themes that we've articulated is the vision of the practice and the practice manager, the values that that company and those people have, the process, lifting the lid on how they're doing their processes, a bit about ownership, motivation and what drives you, and finally the biggie, the people section. So vision, values, process, ownership, and people. Now, with that as a framework, Dean, what jumped out of you? Thanks, Andrew. So we're starting today talking about values. Uh, and so one of the most interesting things that we that I picked up in going through um, this series of podcasts, Andrew, is that we've talked a, we talked a few times last time about values and how they're going through the, most of the firms. Now, the interesting thing for uh, David Maloney is that they've not only got the values, they've introduced this concept which with corporate pillars. And we, we put that under one of values and we wanted to share the quote with you uh, and then have a discussion around it. So we'll share the quote now. We've established uh, four corporate pillars, which is the client experience, um, digital first, uh, operational excellence, and people and culture, or people and community rather. And within those pillars, we've got a range of uh, initiatives that we're looking to roll out. Um, it's about prioritizing them right now. And so I found this really interesting as a focus of the firm. So the values drive behaviors, but also the corporate pillars actually allows for the business to understand what's most important. Uh, and so what was really interesting, obviously, the client experience is one of those one of those pillars and and the team focusing on on that, but digital first as well. And that was a really interesting thing with a multidisciplinary firm is that 
it's it was hard to align service dates of tax returns and ongoing service agreements and then bookkeeping obligations uh, to create that digital first uh, service offering. And so the team down there were doing a lot to try to align all of those things. And this is process as w- as well at the end of the day. Um, but I found that really interesting as a as a thing to focus on first and foremost at the business level. And look, um, being a multidiscipline practice, and we do have some multidiscipline practices um, on our engine room, and they they fill a really wonderful space. And in fact, my background is I had a I had a big multidiscipline business, and you're absolutely correct. Sometimes the the accounting software, the mortgage broking software, the GI software, and the financial planning software has not been built with connectivity in mind. So so putting that as one of your core pillars, I think really demonstrates that they want to be problem solvers and they're looking to to solve solve the problem which is creating efficiency and with efficiency means that obviously you've got happy people but it also means that you can price you can you can price your 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 services at a rate that is fair value to to the client um and we'll come back to potentially where Yarralane has come from later on in the podcast because they never started as a multidiscipline practice. They've got a bunch of different disciplines coming together and I, I would like to do a section on that. But um, when you talk about the values um, of, of the business and creating those pillars, was there any other practices that stood out to you from the get-go that you went, ah, they've got a reasonably clear articulation of what they're all about? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the one of the firms that you interviewed, Andrew, is is obviously close to my heart for those people that are listening. Um, and so, Absolute Wealth Advisors have done a lot of uh, work as well in making sure that the the values are documented. Uh, but more importantly, that they flow through the entire organisation. So that's in the activities that all of the staff do, both uh, to use the onshore and offshore analogy, but through the values flow through all of the staff members, regardless of their location. And the second element is that it also drives our behaviors. So all the way uh, up to that management team, the any problems that we encounter at that business level, Paul's able to use the his values filter to make the right decision and do what's right at the end of the day. So that that was one uh, as well in terms of the values that that sat quite well in terms of the business overall. The other thing that I mentioned, um, or the, the other observation that I had, is that these businesses aren't. Um, aren't all startups. There's some businesses there with, with some quite serious history. Um, there's some businesses that have come out of your real traditional AFSLs. I think there's a couple in there that are in the, in the RI advice camp. There's a couple in the AMP camp. There's a couple we might talk about were self-licensed and now are out. Um, but what they've done is they've reinvented themselves over the last five years. And this is going to be a common theme of the engine room is whether it be legislative change or whether it be looking to to match up with what the current client wants, these practices have reinvented the way in which they do things and they've done that by putting their values as their pillar of their business. And once you've got that right, the people in your business get you, they understand the context. So when when the practice manager or the GM then puts in tools such as technology and whatnot, everyone's on board. They understand the reason why they're doing things. Um, and it also means that you can have team members who are located everywhere. And when we look at these practices, I think we've got businesses in Adelaide, Geelong, Melbourne, Sydney and Warrnambool. I think it just throws the stereotype of you've got to be in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane just out the window. There's such successful businesses that – post-COVID now are in those regional areas, but servicing a particular type of, of, of clientele. Absolutely. I'd love to just talk firstly about the the business that is focused solely on pharmacists, although they, they do have a few other clients uh, now. But the idea that you can focus on pharmacists as your target market, and I, I did a little bit of Googling just so I could understand the numbers, but there's 31,000 pharmacists and so you have to assume that they've got a higher than 20% penetration that more than 20% of pharmacists need and want advice. But it just shows that the ability to specialize in a particular occupation 
can build an 80 person business and with their ambitions that they want to go to 300 staff. Uh, and so I don't know exactly how many clients they have, but it's amazing thought exercise to say, well, could 300 people solely serve the pharmacist of Australia? And most likely the answer is yes. And so, um, that is a combination of understanding where their vision is. They've built those values and obviously on top of that, the, that corporate pillar, but then being really focused on, um, that target market. And we should talk now as well about how they brought uh, three businesses together. Um, and also then bringing three businesses together is very difficult. Uh, three different industries as well, not not merging. So, Andrew, they brought three different businesses together and then they had a name change, which was to try to bring everything together. So, we might start with the quote uh, about this and then and then unpack it a little bit. Oh, this is the Yarra Lane, the evolution of Yarra Lane. Yeah, great. Um, when David articulated that to me, because they had three strong brands, I, I really think that they'll have used that as a touch point with their people going forward, that this was the moment. Mm. And it came down to getting behind something. So, so absolutely, let's hear from David. But ultimately, it became a bit too convoluted and confusing. And what we needed to do was to rebrand. Uh, that was a 10-month process. Um, we had a lot of consultation. We had a fantastic group uh, called ET Collective, an agency uh, that put everything together for us. Um, could not have done it without them. Um, we went through a lot of names, um, ultimately settled on Yarra Lane. Um, we, we think it's a beautiful name. It ties into our roots um, as M Melbournians. Um, but uh, Yarra is a fantastic Indigenous word for you know river and flow. Um, we like to think that we go with the flow of um, our clients. And Lane, it's a bit of a homage to Melbourne as well, but Lane also represents structure, and that's what we ultimately give to our clients. Um, we go with the flow, but we give them structure as well to help them achieve their goals and objectives. Um, so we love the name. We've got the collective group now under that one banner. Um, the messaging is very clear, um, and it allows us to go into... Um, uh, the next realm, uh, we, we did grow from approximately 30 staff uh, three years ago. Um, we're now seeing it about 80. Um, so we've had rapid growth un under that name, um, and that's been a, a, a big part of it. So what I took from that was that that although they had three successful brands, their ambition of bringing new people, I think they wanted their new people to, to realize that they're, that when they join, they're joining a multidiscipline practice, not one. I think they also, when you talk about the engine room, just because you're in administration or operations in financial planning or you're in the accounting doesn't mean that you, you, you're limited to career ambitions of maybe jumping the fence. Mm. I'm sure they all sit in the same room. I'm sure they all, you know, gather around the same water cooler. So, so basically opening that up really just gives you some more flexibility and redundancy in your engine room. And I, I think is, is, is well, well worth it. So that's a, that's a great example. So everyone out there who's thinking about a name change and, and yet again, for the second time in a row, we have no financial planning practices in our engine room that are called something financial planning. So I think that's a real departure. Um, and, uh, I, I'm wondering about your thoughts on, on the names thing. Yeah, look, I think uh, one day I, I talk about names in the first context of saying that Dean Holmes is a financial advisor, proprietary limited, could have been a very simple business name for, for me. Oh, when I, when it's, I it's available started. on GoDaddy as we speak, if you can believe it. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, the context when I first started thinking about that was that the name of the business and the advisor is very much linked when you're talking about a small practice. So, the fact that you call your business Dean Holmes is a financial advisor is actually really valuable and it makes sense when you're a one man a one woman operation when we grow the business uh, name becomes somewhat relevant in order to communicate certain things so pride advice is such a such a powerful name beyond the animal it stands for uh, but the fact that we use that and and the business stands by and is proud of that name is a, is a great example and Burke Britain has a has a great history of a of one of the names of the financial advisors that that started the business of of course uh, but the name is begins to be 
It's the first steps of the journey of the business being its own entity separate from the founders of the business. And so it's one of those challenges as, as you grow to separate the founder of the business, the CEO of the business from the name of the business over time. Absolutely. And when you talk about pride, they're, they were based in Adelaide, but they now have quite a big business in Sydney. And if you don't, if you don't build that, that vision and values, then, then having that disconnect um, can be can be quite difficult. The other facet is I'm looking across at these names here. There's quite a few uh, businesses that do have more than one office. Um, so you know, back in the, the the Lord knows the Cretaceous period when I started in financial advice, culture was all about the people in the four walls in front of you and how you can control the room. But you could do that out of charisma, not that I had any, but you could do that out of, out of some charisma and um, and really sticky tape it together. But when you're in multiple offices. You know, I think there's a quote about ethics, which is, you know, what happens when you're not there or something like that. But I think also that that values ties those businesses together. And I was also then looking at um, pride just in relation to the way in which Brett has had his own values translate into the way in which they engage and charge for their services. Now, a bit of a – if you didn't listen to uh, the pride – podcast um brett a very interesting very interesting person very lovely person started off in the police force in forensics investigated financial planning misbehavior and made his way in so here's a guy who's precise who's straight up and down ethical etc and very interestingly and i'm going to maybe play a quote if we can please here in the magic sound guy um on how brett and pride price their businesses to align with their values we decided that we would actually strip it right back down to the basics and you know, to, to actually have a file open like, like a lawyer does. You know, there's, a, there's a cost to that. There's a compliance cost and a burden. So, and you, so there has to be a fee to that. And then, then it's up to the a combination of the advisor and the clients saying what they do and don't want in terms of the scoping. We then created um, modules. So it's the, the core service and then there's modules that we put on top of it. And if there was a, a particular module that we thought that the client should we should discuss with a client. What would be an example of a module? Um, portfolio management. So that's really interesting, Andrew. I think the idea that they've disconnected their price uh, from certain uh, conflicts, to say, say it that way, or certain percentage-based fees and saying what we're going to do instead is, is separate and split up the service offerings so that you can choose the particular advice path that you would like to go down is great. And obviously, he's been doing this for many years, which is ahead of the curve of, of a lot of other practices. And so, the idea that you can have a core, core offering uh, at Pride, but also then on top of that, uh, pay for extras uh, that is in your best interest. And the advisor is there to not necessarily sell but guide the advice guide the client through that process saying here are your options we can manage money for you and if you'd like us to manage money we will do it in this way otherwise if you don't want us to manage money uh, we can do it in this way and and you can keep your existing uh, investments and so uh, I know that absolute wealth advisors has a similar model in that we've separated the um, the funds under advice part of the business from the strategic advice part of the business. Uh, I happened to get that idea from my former employer of 15 years ago, uh, announcer, in terms of splitting the two cot visionary. The, two, the visionary of, of announcer, um, but splitting the two offerings so that you could actually communicate to your client what they're paying for in each of those different elements. And so I think that that's, that's been a great growth in the business for Pride as well in being pretty clear in their fees up front. Absolutely. And just repeating basic business 101, how you get to your EBITDA or your profit is the revenue you make less the cost that you incur. And I think historically financial planning has been very much hopium where you just hope that the revenue that you you you, you derive covers the cost. There hasn't been this real forensic 
to steal a, a Brett's sort of um, history, forensic method methodology towards pricing that potentially our, our friends in, in accounting and law were all over. Now, I know that a lot of that grates on it, but there's probably a halfway mark. I just thought that that was a, a pretty special way yeah. of, of doing it. In the past, it didn't matter, Andrew. If your business was valued on the top line, why do you care about the bottom line? Uh, whereas we've flipped that around now that the, the larger companies that are coming in to partner with financial planning firms, which we'll talk about a little bit today, uh, they don't care about the revenue exactly. They care about what the multiple of the EBIT is or the EBIT at the end of the day. And so it's great that we're starting to uh, talk about this as an industry to keep everyone focused on what the profit to the shareholders are, as opposed to uh, what the revenue of the revenue of the business is. 100% agree. And, and later on in processes, we're going to talk about just the cost structure and how people have, have, have implemented their cost structure um, and utilized, utilized uh, people in a way that's actually pretty poorly put, isn't it? Utilizing people, that's not very humanistic. So how they've motivated their team. We can edit that out, Andrew. And we probably won't. Um, how they've motivated their team to do the things that are the top priorities for the clients, the practice and themselves, which comes back to having firm values and vision. So with that in mind, I'd love to maybe have a, a quick idea of what jumped out of you, uh, out, out, out to you, sorry, um, in relation to processes, ones that are great. Yes, uh, absolutely. So the processes, if we think about it in terms of the the pod structure versus the pool structure in terms of how that's operating, there was a couple of different options there. Uh, and also when we started to understand the uh, ratios of supports and advisors and, and support staff. So firstly, we had a great example from Pride whereby they're using the, um, they're not using a pod structure. They're essentially using a pooled structure underneath the advisor. And so that was to build some redundancy in the team because there is uh, staffing challenges across all advice businesses. And so having the pool structure meant that the advisors were going to be better supported uh, over that period of time. And so that was a good learning. We'd, we're constantly seeing different models. Uh, and Brett himself said that he's happy to change back to a different model uh, or the pod model later later on. Uh, but the ratio seems to be different across all practices. And so that's the idea of that there's one advisor. Uh, there was two advisors, I think, in um, in David's business, in, in Yarra, two advisors, one CSO, one para planner as a, as a team pod yep. in order to get work done. And so that was a great uh, example of, of how the business might operate there as well as going back to Brad is that his goal was to essentially have advisors at the just doing a file notes uh, and that really solid engine room back office taking the variety of the the work off the advisors and that in his context will allow him to scale much better. So a couple of different models in terms of business process about ha how are we handing work between let's call it the front office and the engine room how are we handing r work back to the engine room absolutely and i think there's a couple of themes here so if we rewind the clock and i'll go through some of my uh history is that when when i was quite unquote building my engine room um i really looked at the tasks that were involved to deliver for the client and I thought at the time that all I needed to do was get people to do the tasks. And, and if they did them and they all stuck together, then the client would get an outcome. But what you drop the ball on is that if you've got 10 different people doing 10 different tasks, that commonality of relationship and knowing the client and knowing the context of what you're doing, and even also just the caring level. So if I've got a task to do when I finish it, I've kind of done my job. But if I've got Mr. and Mrs. Smith who I need to completely achieve a financial outcome, I become invested in the client outcome. And I think what that leads to is the difference between people who have uh, in engine rooms who have, have a potentially either insourced or outsourced task specific business. So that's sending over, you know, whether it be um, tax returns or power planning or, or any kind of things and people that have moved towards bringing people into a dedicated team. Um, and I think there's a, a really good quote um, from uh, your partner, actually, um, Paul Barrett from Absolute Wealth on um, exactly that. So the journey that he's had. And I'd love to maybe just uh, let, let Paul take center stage and, and tell us that journey. When we knew that model was broken, we, we looked to go outsourcing. But we went, first of all, to one of those outsourcing teams where you've got two or three 
allocated staff, but they work for other practices as well. And you put it put, and that was terrible. We spent two years trying to make that work. And because they're working for multiple practices, um, they wouldn't, we couldn't control them. They were doing the same thing three or four different ways. So there were errors, there were delays. It was just. When you say it out loud, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? I know. It's, um, and, and, and they're also not aligning with your culture and, and your personality. And they're not, not their fault, not their fault. No. But yeah, so, so then, then how did that play out? So the next thing is we, uh, we went to, uh, BA Platinum. And that's been amazing. So from day one, we had dedicated staff and we, we literally call them our staff. This is not offshoring outsourcing. These are just our staff who work overseas. Yes. So that was a good learning for us, Andrew. And I can speak firsthand that the mistake that was made, uh, and the learning from it, um, and we always are constantly learning as Amy would, would know as well. And she spoke of is that we chose to get tasks allocated or outsourced as we use that word. We chose to get tasks outsourced, which meant that we lost a little bit of control around the timing, the quality, and also the client outcome at the end of the day. And so, our learning was to pivot away from outsourcing a particular task and lean into humans doing the work for us. And so that was where we uh, partnered with VA Platinum and through that process made sure that we were having great people in our business that once again knew and understood our vision and vision and values, wanted to help the clients at the end of the day and help the advisors to see more clients. And so that was a great learning for us through this process. And I think that that's uh, interesting as well that besides Amy's business, Burke Britain, the remainder of the businesses have uh, gone through an out- a journey of partnering with firms um, to get the remote staff. And Amy's learning on the flip side for her honesty was actually that it didn't work for them. And that's amazing, A, because in business, we need to learn when things don't go well and be open and adaptable to change and unpacking as they, I'm sure they have done and will most likely look at it in the future again is unpacking why did that particular thing go wrong? And that was the same for us uh, in Absolute Wealth Advisors. When we unpacked what was going wrong, it was all around the path that we had taken around the cho- the choice to delegate a task or outsource a task as opposed to get everything done within our business, with our team. Yeah, look, and I think um, with, with the Burke Britain team, they do actually have people in their power planning business that they 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 call um, contractors. But, you know, is a contractor someone who's been doing the same job for you for 10 to 12 years as Burke Britain? So I think it might only be in name. I think if you ask those power planners who work with the lovely team at Burke Britain, they would probably feel like they're part of the Correct. team. So it, 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 it might be in name only. And they've chosen to do that exercise and then bring their, their client sort of uh, governance and, and oversight and care in-house, which also works as well. Um, but the big thing there is, how do you how do you manage to look after your people? Okay, so as a CEO or a practice manager, and let's focus on the practice manager because they're they're the sandwich role. Okay, so they've got to look after all of their team and also babysit the the, the CEO or the board, right? So, and some of the people on do perform both roles, and as we've said before, some of them. Uh, have been in advice as frontline advisors and gravitating across and others such as Amy have come through the, the pure play into practice management. So I really enjoyed talking with uh, Brad Rogers. Um, I've known Brad for many years and um, the good thing is he's practicing what he's preaching as far as growing his business, but he's growing it by building out the capacity in his engine room and following on from uh, Paul's learnings in relation to how to build people who want to work for you, there's actually a really lovely section where he goes on to how he's managed to motivate his global team. Okay. And Brad, Brad is a, is a, is a client of VBP that I, that I'm involved with. Um, but he's a standout in some of the things that he's done to make their team feel part of the wealth shore team. And I'd love just to play a quick excerpt of that. We brought our first VBP, who, her name is Char. She's been with us for over five years now, and she's now doing. She's now in our office, so she's come to Australia for a, for a month just to be part of 
to be to be part of the team. So that's a short quote from Brad about how he's managed to bring one of his staff members over to Australia to experience uh, the office environment uh, in in where's he Womberall? Yep, Womberall. Yep, yep, the so Surf Coast, the cheese. You get cheese down there as well, I think. Um, but the the ability to bring your staff member from Cebu in the Philippines across to Australia to get them to experience what it's like here. What a great. Uh, execution of their, their company values uh, and that people retention is going to be so uh, valuable. Now, because my team is going to be listening to this as well, I, I will remind them uh, that part of their 10-year retention plan, like a uh, long service leave, is that they all get a trip to Australia. So, Bentley and Katie are at five years, so they're halfway uh, to that trip to Australia as well. And we think that that's a great way of continuing to support our team and also letting them uh, know that they're going to be on their way to Australia as well. Well, uh, thanks for doing your uh, your annual review there, Dean. Um, I'm sure that uh, that this is a very private forum for doing that. I'm sure they'll be super pumped. And now you're buggered, so you've got to do that. Um, I also then wanted to touch on, we're talking processes and we're talking financial advice and there's no escaping that all, that the AFSL Forms part of, or forms part of the pillars of how each one of these businesses operate. And what's, what's surprising yet again, there's no common themes, but what I would be very interested in your thoughts is that, that, uh, I just from memory, uh, prior to with RI advice, they're, they're, they're one of their, their big practices, but they also, um, so is, so is Wellshaw. Um, uh, I know the Burke Britner and AMP, uh, a AMP business, and yeah, another example of one of those AMP businesses that have that have reinvented themselves. Okay, and um, I know that the Absolute Wealth um, team recently went to Paragym, and I think we touched on that that last time from being self licensed. So, um, what was your thoughts on choosing a AFSL as your business partner, and does it bloody matter? Well. What I'm seeing evidence, and my evidence is part of part of why I'm telling this story now, is that we can see that large licensees and large businesses are going hand in hand. So there was a theme, I suppose, getting spoken about, about once you get to a certain size, you should become self-licensed or that self-licensing is is an easier path. And what we're seeing here is businesses with 30 and, uh, you know, 25 and 30 staff are working with RI advice. And so that is uh, owned by um, IWF uh, insignia. Uh, and so that's an example of where, where they're still partnering with what, those larger firms. Uh, Absolute's partnered with Paragem. We've given up, we gave up our AFSL to move to Paragem. I know one of the other firms as well went through that same exercise of, Actually, giving up their AFSL and moving uh, moving into a licensee, and so we're seeing this evidence that partnering with a with a larger licensee allows you to grow. And so it's not the only path, but definitely the idea that that you need to get value from your licensee. And what was happening through that process is we were seeing that the firms that were getting that are growing are leaning into their licensee to get something from them. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? The good licensees are not only allowing them to lean in, but they're also bringing stuff to the table. And what I potentially might throw to you, Dean, to talk a bit more about is, yes, there's licensees in the ecosystem. There's also now groups of organisations who are working with practices um, in as far as being a capital partner. So there's some, there's some groups out there as capital partners. Um, there's some that are very well known. There's some that are emerging in the market. And I know in particular, there's a couple of the businesses that we interviewed that do have a capital partner. And maybe I'd get you to articulate how that is beginning to, to play out and where you think that's going. And then what I'd love you to do is I, 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 I look at this engine room and I go through these, these five and they're all massively ambitious people. Um, and, you know, what jumps out at me is that when we were talking with Amy, okay, she's not just looking towards financial advice to inspire her. She's gone and, and done some, some courses and whatnot that, that we spoke earlier are just really awesome and really powerful. So I'd love you to touch on that as well. And then a bit about the people. So that would be fantastic. 
Um, so Dean, maybe over to you, maybe we'll start with a bit of the, the, new, the new type of ownership structure that may or may not be linked to the AFSL and then flow through that. Over to you, Dean. Thanks, Andrew. So the first thing uh, that we went through there is the actual ownership of the firm. So what we've been uh, observing through the current participants in the uh, in the podcast for the last five is there's a couple of corporate owners. And the interesting thing that's happening as a result of that is, is the discipline around the creation of business plans, the creation of a framework and a board of advice. And so, um, as an example, we were seeing that, um, uh, Brett was very, uh, happy to be partnering with an equity partner. And what he spoke about in the podcast in terms of what he was happy with was actually the fact that he um, had an accountability partner who was able to take it forward in terms of having a annual meeting, quarterly board meetings, and monthly action items to have that discipline to continue to grow and run his business. So we're seeing that theme come through the businesses and that can, that's coming from an equity partner and it's also coming from uh, business coaching as well as a, as a secondary theme of bringing in uh, a business coach to set that framework and foundation in place such that we're actually growing the business in a disciplined way. So I know Absolute Wealth Advisors as an example, have we've had a business coach in that practice for about six years, focused on uh, the discipline around the execution of the business plan. And from there, we've been able to focus on the future growth of the, growth of the business. When we turn our attention to uh, Amy, um, she'll love the, the discipline words that we're talking about today. Got a quote from Amy that I'd love to share uh, with you now and then talk a little bit about what she's done. Yeah, interestingly, they haven't been management courses per se and they haven't been financial planning based. So one that I completed in Melbourne pre-COVID in person was called Landmark. Uh, so that focused a lot on not spinning stories in your head pretty much and not um, – not diving into some spiral of what might happen or has happened. So that, that was really good. It was, like I said, it wasn't uh, management-based. It was more personal-based and personal growth. Uh, so I did that one. And at the moment, I actually still do weekly at the moment, Echelon Front, which is around extreme ownership. So it's about leadership, ownership, um, you know, taking taking control of your own decisions and helping those around you become leaders as well. So I've really focused on personal growth more than anything, you know, certificate based or financial planning based. It's always been on my radar to do something like that. But for myself in my role, I've really liked the growth side of things more than ticking a box for some sort of compliance or or knowledge. So Amy's uh, having to be self-taught and this is a theme within the engine room is we're seeing lots of the business managers, practice managers that are coming through, they're actually, there's not a lot of training available to them besides what we call the apprenticeship or on the job training of working within the practices. And so Amy had to source a couple of different uh, training elements in order to grow her, uh, grow her knowledge and position. And so I know the echelon front is a great example whereby it, it has to be the furthest thing from financial planning, for those that don't know, um, it's a guy called Jocko Willick, who's essentially an ex-Navy SEAL uh, for, in America, and he runs a leadership and coaching business, uh, and he's written a couple of books. My, one of my favorite is the Discipline Equals uh, Freedom concept, and so what that's allowed um, – Amy to do is understand the concept of extreme ownership uh, and it's exciting when you say the word and get excited and see uh, Jocko talk about it but this is an example whereby uh, Amy had to go out of the industry to seek a new level of understanding in, in terms of how to work and then also how to motivate her team and so she, the example of, of her career has been that she's worked within the same business for a long period of time and came there at, at a young age. And so at some point in your journey, you, the, 
vast majority of your career has been spent within one firm. And so if you're not doing an element of training externally, it's very difficult to bring new ideas and new focuses within your business. And so Amy is a great example of, of going forth and, and actually seeking uh, additional advice uh, for external to the, to the in- industry. So t- tell me about the rise of the practice manager. So the other thing, Andrew, in relation to the people is that we're seeing a good theme of business managers coming within the firm. And so be it practice, practice manager, business manager, or those couple of different roles. Um, and that's really interesting. So Brett's had a practice manager within the business now for 13 years. And so that's a great example of the longevity of the operational side of the business. Obviously, Amy is a, is a part of that business as well. And so the theme around elevating these operational managers is, is interesting. So we're seeing that the salaries and the role descriptions of the people that are running the engine room are actually starting to approach the same amount of salary that you would pay a financial advisor. And so that's really important because it's, it shows that you can grow your income and also grow your status within companies and not necessarily be the front end financial advisor. So there's great people that don't want to sit in front of clients that will be able to pursue a career within financial planning now and successfully earn sufficient to grow the, grow their personal wealth. The other element of that has been the theme around employee share schemes and employees and part owners coming into the business. And so we've definitely seen this a, a few times across the business. It's not easy to bring in an employee uh, ESOP, as they say, but there's, there's, it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is there's constant questions on when the right time is. What we found first and foremost is that now these questions are being asked of not only the advisors, but also the support staff within the business. So we're seeing that the business manager is equally as valuable as one of the front end advisors. And so they're both having the opportunity to participate in employee share schemes. The challenge, and, and David was talking about this, the challenge is essentially the, the timing of when to bring the equity ownership conversation. You can't bring it up necessarily on day one of the interview, but when is that right period of time to, that an employee should be working in the business um, before they're invited into the ownership plan? And then when they're in there, how long does, do they have to stay to, to realize that full benefit? I think that's a challenge for a couple of the business owners just in relation to when, when the right time is. Well, thank you, Dean. Look, that was really, really well summarised. And um, uh, employee share schemes or just sharing part of success is absolutely part of building uh, businesses into the future. Now, um, I've really enjoyed unpacking uh, these five wonderful practices today. And without any further ado, I'd like to thank you, Dean, very, very much for being my partner in crime, unpacking these businesses um, and with the engine room. Until next time, Dean. Thanks, Andrew. See you on the next episode.